Good afternoon, everyone. How is everyone doing? Thank you for coming in to another session of NCIC Fellowship Bible Study Group. Remember, NCIC stands for New Creation in Christ. And that's what our focus is as we grow and study the word to show ourselves of proof that we will become new creation in Christ, because it is Christ that renews us and gives us our hope. It is the Lord that transforms our mind, Lord, and changes us. So without further ado, we're going to get into today's lesson. Today's lesson is the apologetics, okay? Apologetics. So I want to read a scripture verse, and then I'm going to pray, and then we'll go right into the lesson. Okay. So the scripture verse I'm reading from is 1 Peter chapter 3, and I'm going to start at verse 13, and I'm going to read through 15. And it reads, and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed and do not be afraid of the threats nor the trouble or nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always, here's the message, always be ready to give defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. That's what today's message is, apologetics. Always be ready to give a defense. Heavenly Father, in the name of Yeshua, I come to you to thank you, to lift you up, to worship you, to magnify you, for you are great and greatly to be praised. You are high and lifted up. We thank you, Lord Father God, for this time, for this hour, that we are able to gather here together in your name to read and study the word that we may show ourselves approved. Now I pray, Lord Father God, that the spirit of the living God come dwell with us, open up our minds, open up our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears, help us to receive your word, that it may take root and grow, Lord Father God, that we may change and be transformed by your word, because your word has that power to change and transform us. Help us, Lord, Father God. We thank you in the name of Yeshua, I pray. Amen. Okay, guys, so let's go ahead and get right into today's lesson. Today's lesson is a little lengthy. Um, I um, was considering breaking it up into uh, two parts, but we're going to go ahead and try to get through this in one session. So I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. Okay, and here we go. Can everybody see the screen? Okay. All right, so today's lesson is apologetics. Apologetics, what is apologetics? Apologetics, it is a Greek word from the root word apologia, meaning verbal defense. In other words, giving a verbal defense for your belief and revelation of the gospel of Yeshua, Jesus and the word of God, the Bible, which is your Christian apologetics. So the question, questions that we have heard, where did the term Christian come from? Because most people have no idea where that term Christian came from. Well, the answer, Christian, it also is a Greek word, a root word from Christianos meaning follower of Christ, the anointed one. That's what Christ means, the anointed one. In Hebrew, that word is Mashiach, Messiah, which also means anointed. So the term Christian was first used in Greek in a city of Antioch. We can find that in Acts 1126. So let's go ahead and read that so we can see our proof because anything that we study and anything that you all hear me say, I want to be able to show you 
where it comes from, and to show you the proof. So let's go ahead and turn to Acts. And we're going to go to chapter 11, verse 26. And I'm going to go ahead and start at verse 25. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. Then he found him. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year, they assembled with the church and they taught um, a great many of people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Okay, so there you go, guys. Ephesians, I'm sorry, Acts 11, 26. Now, the definition of Christian is one who follows and believes that Yeshua, Jesus, is the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, that he came to save us through our sins, came us, I'm sorry, excuse me, guys, he came to save us from our sins through his death and believe that he is the begotten son of God one that believes that he was crucified for our sins, buried and rose from the dead with all power and ascended back to heaven and is now seated at the right hand of Abba, Father, Yahweh, Elohim is his name. So why do we believe what we believe? Okay, so here's some questions that we typically hear about your Christian belief or your Christian faith. Or your, your faith walk. Have you ever questioned what you believe or if the Bible was actually true? Like, has that question ever ran across your mind? Has anyone ever said to you or have you heard it said, which I'm sure you have because it's all over in the world today because people find reasons to be skeptics. But have you ever heard it said, how do you know the Bible was accurate? Or is true because it's written by man. Hmm, we hear that a lot. Or it's been translated so many times that it has many errors, so it can't be true, which supports the argument and the reason for skeptics to have atheistic views of God or support why people follow after other gods and other religious doctrines and books. So let's address some of these questions. So here's another question. There are so many religions, so many paths to take. How do you know which is the correct path? How do you know which is the right way? I'm sure you guys have had that question run around in your head at some point in your life. I had that same question many years ago. And this is the reason why you got to seek out the truth. This is the reason why you have to pray and ask God. He's not afraid of your questions. Okay, so the answer. In the Bible, Yeshua said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No man comes unto the Father but by me. John 14, 6. So here is the path to take. Jesus, he's the path. He's the right way. Okay. Another question, what if you don't believe in the Bible? What other proof does one have to know that they're following the correct path? Okay, so let's take a look at this. Christians believe in the Bible. So the word says, Jesus said out of his own mouth, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. But what if a person don't believe in the Bible? So there we have the issue that we need to sort out. Now, there are so many other proofs that this word of God is true, okay? So the answer is God gave us the power of choice, okay? But we can't answer this with just one concrete answer. So follow with me now. God gave us the power of choice. I'm gonna say that one more time. God gave us the power of choice. One must choose what has been proven to be 100% accurate. 
If you want to know if something is the right way or something is the right thing to do and you have choices to make because there's so many choices to make, would you go with the choice that is 50% accurate? Would you choose the choice that looks so close to the truth, 80% accurate? Would you go with something that just, it is totally not accurate at all. It's totally against all the other things. Or would you choose what is proven to be 100% accurate? Let's take this journey. Take this journey with me. One must never follow after doctrines based on a few selected verses from the Bible or written books that parallel or glean from the Holy Bible. I have read many religious books that if you put them side by side, doing a theological study or religious study, you'll say, well, this is similar, but there are some very vast differences because what you find is books, especially if it's written after the Bible, that they glean from the Holy Bible and then change it to make it fit their agenda. Anyway, so let's go back to our 100% proof. So I'm gonna give you some food for thought, okay? Let's think about this. Why are so many other religi religions parallel their belief off of the Bible and Jesus, the savior? And why do other religions take parts of the scriptures to believe and twist it twist the meanings to fit their own agendas and doctrines, but then they reject the whole Bible. If you don't believe it, you don't believe it. Don't try to believe part of it and say, well, oh, I believe this part, but I don't believe that part. But then you call other people hypocrites. Think about that concept. If you don't believe it, why are you even in it? Is either you're going to believe it or you're not going to believe it. There's a measure of faith. But now let's go beyond faith and let's go to some, some concrete evidence of why this book and the belief in Christ and Christianity is the true, as Christ said, the way, the truth, and the light, which is in him. Let's find some, let's go and look at some proof. What does, what is your apologetics for what you believe or why you believe the Holy Scriptures, the Holy Bible? What is your apologetic? Remember that word apologetic means a verbal defense. Studying your faith and knowing what you believe or why you believe it is imperative for faith building and giving a defense to others that believe differently than you or try to make you doubt your own Christian walk. There are so many movements and awareness in so many different things that if you are not rooted and grounded in your faith, you will be tossed to and fro like the wind and confused. Ephesians 4.14 this is the plan and the trickery of the adversary, the devil. Yes, especially in religions and faith awareness movements, things that look spiritual. So it is very vital and important to know what you believe. We, we don't operate in blind faith. This is why we study the word for ourselves. This is why we have to go beyond a, a 20 minute sermon. This is, be, this is why we have to go beyond fellowshipping in church and just have a church fellowship. And you know we don't know the word for ourselves. This is why we study. We don't have blind faith because mama said, my mama was a Christian, my grandma was a Christian, my, you know, my daddy did this, or, or my family does this, or it's our tradition, or I was just born a Christian. No, 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 no. No blind faith. We are going to know, or have an apologetic. We're going to know what we believe and why we believe. That is the goal of this particular lesson. So let's start our reading. Let's go to Ephesians 4, 14, and then we're going to go to 1 Peter 3, 15. All right. 
Ephesians 4 and verse 14. And it reads that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of man in the cunning and craftiness and deceitful plotting. Okay, now let's go to 1 Peter. And we're going to read, we're going to go to chapter 3, verse 15. And it reads, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to give defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Always be ready to give a reason for the hope. That is what apologetics is. So the word Bible, it is a Latin Greek word, Biblia, meaning books, because it's a collection of many books in one book. So a lot of skeptics say, oh, the word Bible is not even in the Bible. No, I can't believe that because that particular word is not in the Bible. That's a very weak excuse for not believing um, in the Bible. Those become excuses. So let's look at some historical facts. The Bible is a collection of writings from 40 different scribes, 40 different writers wrote the Bible, okay? It was written over 6,000, 1600 years time period. The scriptures is inspired by God himself, 2 Timothy 2, 316. So let's stop right there and let's read that. This is for those who believe in the word of God, but we're, I'm going to show you more, many, many more evidence uh, for those who don't believe in the Bible. So in 2 Timothy, And we're going to go to um, verse three, I'm sorry, chapter three, verse 16. And it reads, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, by the inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness. That is the purpose, to reprove us, to correct us, and to give us instructions in righteousness. That's why God inspired man to write. Let's read on. The Bible is historically, scientifically, and prophetically correct in all accuracy. All. It's the only written book that has from the beginning of the pages to the end that is has prophecies that are that is yet to come that has um that's going on right now that's been proven and still yet to come so let's address the skeptic of the skepticism of it's written by man despite the age-old argument that the bible is written by man isn't never in question that it actual, actually the ink to paper was done by mankind. But the content and what was being written did not merely come from the imaginations and the intellect of the writer. It is inspired by God himself. Remember that we are made in God's image and likeness to represent him and his glory here on earth. We are created to worship. Therefore, God put us here and God also gave his word and instructions, his laws and his prophecies, which are signs and warnings for us to live by. You understand that? God created us in his image and likeness. He put us here and he gave his word. Well, how did he give his word? He spoke to prophets, he spoke to kings, he spoke through judges, 
he spoke through his son Yeshua himself. And these things were written down. They were scribed. God knows what he's doing, people. Just think, if man by himself wrote the Bible, which that's, that's the skeptics claim, oh, man wrote the Bible. Well, if man by man's own intellect, by man's own self wrote the Bible, he could also go in and rewrite it and make the ending the way he wanted to make it, make it, right? Man would not write the consequences of sin and idolatry that would lead to his own death. If you were writing a book, wouldn't you, would you write, um, oh, if I don't obey God, if I don't do keep God's laws, if I turn to other gods, if I worship idols that, you know, my unrighteousness is going to lead me to my sinfulness without accepting Christ is going to lead me to death and hell. If I have the power and the intellect to sit and write this book myself, may I also could go in and change it to make it a sweet ending. Man would not write a book that would condemn themselves to hell or rejecting for rejecting God and following his own life or following after Satan, man would write a book that would fit their own fantasies, pleasures, and good things. Man would not write a book that didn't allow them to live the way they wanted to live. Because in the flesh, we, we want to do what we want to do. We wouldn't write a book, a Bible that wouldn't allow us to do our own thing. And then we still could get in heaven. That's what man would do if man wrote it because they would, hey, you can do whatever you want to do, you know, and you still can get in heaven. You think about that concept. God is a holy God. He's awesome. He's mighty. He's all powerful. He's loving, but he's also just. You can't just do what you want and still get in heaven and get blessed. Think about that. When we say, oh, man just wrote the Bible. It was inspired by God. Also consider this, what man can write about things to come and make predictions and it is act and it actually happens word for word in 100% accuracy, unless it was inspired by a higher source, an ultimate power, which is our father Elohim the creator, the same God that spoke life and creation into existence is the same God that spoke his word into man to write, record, and preserve for doctrine, reproof, and for our correction. 2 Timothy 3.16 that we just wrote, we just read. So now let's address that it was written by multiple writers because that's kind of unique. Um, the one unique thing about the Bible is that it was written by uh, multiple writers, 40 different authors, okay? So the writers of the Bible wrote in three different languages, okay? Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek, which when Jesus was here, those were the three languages in which Jesus spoke as well. English was not something that was around at that time. Nevertheless, it, the, they wrote the Bible in three different languages, as I said, Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek, and they came from three different continents. These writers came from Asia, Africa, and Europe. This means they came from different cultures, different back backgrounds, and they all bear witness to the same harmonies of the word of God. The subject that they wrote about, they were complex and controversial. They were historical facts and eyewitness accounts. It was, they wrote about poetry and wisdom, prophecies and revelations. They wrote about kings and kingdoms, battles and defeats, saints and sinners. Satan and deception, praise and worship, moral law and justice. They wrote also about salvation and eternal life. 
40 different authors from three different continents speak in three different languages and all bear witness to the same harmony, yet the writings are all accurate and they all shared agreement about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you go from the Old Testament to the, the um, Psalms of David and the Proverbs of Solomon and to the New Testament, the, the, uh, the apostles of Jesus Christ, and then the book of Acts, and on to the, the apostles writing their letters to the revelation that John got, all of it bears witness to the same thing, the same Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. From the beginning to the end, they all bear witness. There was no schisms, if you will. Okay, so now let's talk about the historical and the scientific proof. So this is good for those people who just, I don't believe in the Bible. So let's talk about some scientific proof and, and some historical proof, because now let's come out of uh, the Bible to show proof and let's go into history and science, okay? The Bible is the only holy scripture that is not copied from any other text, Okay, there are many religious doctrines and many religious scriptures and many other religious books that all glean from the Bible or take parts of the Bible. People make their own doctrines, their own Bibles. They have all these different names, but the Bible itself is the only scripture that is not copied from any other book that has historically been sound and proven historically proven. The things written in the Bible have been accurate, um, actual historical facts that people lived to see these things actually happening. These were, uh, there were eyewitness proof and uh, recorded of historical facts that were prophesied about previously, and then they came um, to pass and people saw it. People wrote it down. They wrote what they saw. And as they wrote what they saw, it, it, bear witness to the prophecy that was prophesied before it happened. The Bible is not merely oral tradition or passed down from generation to generation or legends or it's not mythology, okay? Many non-believers set out to disprove prove the Bible's accuracy. Many archaeologists spent many of years looking for clues and evidence for the miracles of the Bible because they just could not phantom in, their, in our own small intellectual mind. We don't realize that as much intellect as we have and as smart as we think we are, it is nothing compared to the, the all-powerful, all-knowing God. And we think that we know so much. And even today, people are still trying to figure out the Bible. Well, if the Bible isn't true, why do people waste their time so much? If they think it's not true, wouldn't it be a waste of time trying to disprove it? And we're in 2020 and people still, as much as they try to disprove it, always come back afterwards after finding all of these historical and scientific facts, they actually come out believing that the word of God is true. When they started their journey to disprove it, they found out that it was true, okay? Um, the validity of the Bible, um, the books are so controversial and so life-changing. This is the only book that a person can read. This is not just a self-help guide. This book will transform and renew your mind. It will change you. You will be a new creation in Christ. You will be a new person. If you, if you get into this and get into this word and be honest and faithful, God knows your heart. This book, these words are life-changing, transformation. Hallelujah. Okay, and even today, sciences are still, scientists are still discovering the things that, are, um, that were already written about in the Bible are true. They're, 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 every time you hear science discovered something, science discovered something, well, it's interesting because if you go and read in the Word of, in the word of God, you will see that 
that was already spoken and already written or already prophesied about. For instance, the prophet Jeremiah wrote in his, in his writings, he wrote that the stars are too numerous to count. In Jeremiah 33, 22, that's what he said. The stars are too numerous to count. Well, scientists have discovered that the only they can only count a few thousand stars with the telescope, but unable to see or count them all. Well, it had to take science to say that before people believed it. But guess what, people? The same Bible that people don't want to believe, the same Bible that they say was written by man, but we know it's inspired by God. Had, Jeremiah already wrote that the stars were too numerous to count. Jeremiah had already wrote that. Okay. Okay. But it took science to prove it to the world. Okay. But it takes a believer in their faith to read it in the word of God and know that it's true. And we don't need science to prove anything to us. But for those who don't want to or choose selectively not to believe in this world, word it's all powerful because it is god is it is his word is we believe because it's there and so let's go on to some more scientific proof you know years ago scientists said that uh, the earth was flat you guys remember when all of that was going around and people and they, it, you know, it was everywhere. There's the big debate about the earth being flat versus being round. Well, the Bible says that the earth is round. Okay. The prophet Isaiah said that the earth was circled. That means round. In Isaiah 40, 22, he said he sits in throne. So let's go and read what um, Isaiah, let's go to Isaiah and we are going to read, start at chapter 40 and verse 22. And listen to what Isaiah says. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and his, in, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and he spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Okay. Saying that God stretches out the heavens like a curtain. You know how a curtain is over and covers, covers um, things. That's what uh, he's saying, how he stretches the heavens. But here he says that he sits above the circle of the earth. Okay. If it has not clicked or you didn't get an epiphany, I hope by the grace of God, you are starting to get an epiphany because listen, in ancient, ancient Greek time, the discovery, they discovered that the world was round. It was the Hellenist astronomers later that discovered that the earth was round in ancient Greek time. And then later years, NASA discovered that the earth was really round, proving that the Hellenist discovery, um, that the what the Hellenist discovered was true. And But the Bible had already stated that. So the Greek astronomers, they set out to find out whether the earth was flat or round. And the Hellenistic astronomers they discovered the earth was round there was still that debate whether it was round or whether it's flat so here come in modern time in our time here comes nasa and nasa discovers you understand they discover what is already written and they're just now discovering it like it's a discovery but the word of god already said that i the prophet isaiah already said that god sits above the circle of the earth so you did not have to go through all of the science science and all of these years going back and forth trying to do these hypotheses and trying to figure things out to prove what God had already told us. God already told us through the prophet Isaiah that he sits above the circle of the earth, that the earth was round. 
Again, proving that what's in this Bible is accurate and true. So uh, let's go, let's move on. So archaeologists, they also found an ain't the ancient temple of Solomon in North Syria in the ninth century. They found inscriptions of King David. Archaeologists, they found this. These archaeologists were not Christians. These archaeologists were not believers. They were archaeologists doing their job trying to find proof because that's their job. And they found it. Also, they found in the Eastern Desert the inscription Yahweh of Samaria. Yahweh is the name of God. It is the Hebrew name of God. So when they find an inscription with this same name of God in its accuracy, we have to know that it's not a coincidence that the Bible says his name is Yahweh, and then later they find in the Eastern Desert an inscription that says Yahweh of Samaria. We know that Samaria was an actual, that is an actual, actual town. Okay. The Bible tells us, the Bible talks about the Samaritans in Samaria. Well, we know that the name Yahweh is the proper Hebrew name for Yahovah in Exodus 6.3. God told Moses that his name was Yahovah. This supports the discovery of the inscribed name Yahweh of Samaria. There have been claims of 99% nine accuracy, the discovery of Noah's Ark in Turkey, okay? Beneath the snowy and volcanic rocks in 2007 at Mount Ararat. They said that's where they found it. Well, that's what the Bible says where Noah's Ark landed. It landed on top of a mountain. That's what the word. That's what the word of God says in Genesis. They sent radiocarbon dated wood. It was taken from that site where they discovered this this uh, fossilized ark, and they examined it, and it was determined to be that wood was determined to be four thousand eight hundred years old, which would have been the exact timing of the biblical story where Noah's ark landed and the timing of the flood. As now, I this was cited from National Geographic. So this was not information taken from the Bible, even though we know it's in the Bible. This is information that is discovered by worldly uh, scientists and archaeologists, and, 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 and now they have that proof. Okay. So for those who don't believe, given an apologetic for what you believe and why you believe, there has been scientific proof. So now let's talk about, we talked about biblical proof that the Bible is true. And we stand on our faith because it's in the Bible. We know that it was inspired by God. We, we talked about some scientific and historical facts and some proof. So now let's go and talk about prophecies. My favorite subject, prophecies fulfilled. So you guys hang in there with me because we're going to be a minute on this, okay? So if you need to take a little break, we can take a little break. You can hit the, the pause button right now and pause me. Go get you some coffee. Go take a bathroom break. Refresh yourself and come back because now we're getting ready to go into the prophecies that were fulfilled. And we're not going to go, we're not going to, we're only going to scratch the surface. We're not going to even talk about all the prophecies because we don't have enough time for that. And they're still being fulfilled even today. Even today, people, check the news. The West is on fire. Hurricanes are everywhere. Rioting people, killing people, nations against nations. Check the news. Prophecies are being fulfilled right now in 2020, especially in 2020. Anyway, so let's talk about prophecies fulfilled. 
it is impossible for a man to sit down and write and predict future events in perfect accuracy if man just wrote it. What man is that smart? What man has that much foreknowledge of what's going to happen unless it was inspired by God? Come on, people, think about it. The Bible has over 2,000 prophecies that most have been fulfilled and some we see now being fulfilled in our day and some is yet to come. For example, let's just talk about some prophecies of our Lord Yeshua, Jesus. Over 300 prophecies in the Torah, the Old Testament, that have been fulfilled by his birth, life, death, burial, and resurrection. Just, we just want to, just let's focus on that. We're not going to even talk about all the other prophecies just yet. Let's just focus on the prophecies of Jesus, okay? So, the birth of Jesus, it will all prophesy a hundred years before Yeshua was here on earth. It was already prophesied before he even came, hundreds of years before he came. So let's go to Micah 5. Let's go to the book of Micah. All right. Micah is after Jonah. And we're going to go to chapter 5, verse 2 through 4. And it reads, But you, Bethlehem, Ephra, though you are little among the thousands of of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be the ruler of Israel, whose going forth are from old and everlasting. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. And then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, and they shall abide, and now he shall be great to the ends of earth. This is a prophecy about the coming Messiah, that he will be born in Bethlehem. So now let's turn to Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 7, and we will see where the prophecy was fulfilled. Let's go to chapter 2, and we're going to read 1 through 7. And it reads, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, all the world should be registered. This census first took place in Quirinius was the governing of Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. And Joseph went up from Galilee out to the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was from the house of the lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were complete for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room in the inn. Okay, people, this is the prophecy fulfilled. Micah prophesied that this Messiah would come and that he would be born in Bethlehem, a small place in Judah, okay? So what happened here is God is so awesome. He caused Caesar Augustus to call for a census. We know what a census is. We're going through census right now where you they want to count who is belongs to who and what household and where they're from. So because Joseph, they were in, they were not in Bethlehem. They were in Nazareth. Remember, they were in Nazareth. Because the census took place, Joseph had to take Mary, his pregnant wife, and travel back 
to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, so that he can be counted in the census. Now, when they were there, bam, Mary gives birth to Jesus. Prophecy fulfilled. Hallelujah. Woo. Okay, let's continue. Isaiah 7, 14. This is the prophecy of what type of birth, okay? What type of birth? So we talked about where the birth, the prophet, we showed where the, um, the prophecy of where he was going to be born. Now we're going to talk about what type of birth. And Isaiah prophesied what type of birth it would be. So let's turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. And it reads, and therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So what type of birth is this going to be? A virgin is going to give birth to a child. Well, we know in the physical, virgins can't give birth because virgins have not laid with their husbands and conceived to give birth. But Isaiah prophesied that a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And he also said what his name would be, Emmanuel, which translates God with us. Because when Christ was born, God was with us. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. First John 1. Okay, so now let's go to the prophecy fulfilled. Let's go to Matthew 1, 18 to 22. And it reads, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother, Mary, was betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, Son of David, do not be afraid. Take, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son and you shall call his name Yeshua. And he will save his people from their sins. And all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall bear a child and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which translate God with us. That's almost like a drop the mic moment, okay? This is so clear. I pray that you all have the eyes to see and the ears to hear what the Lord is saying. I pray that the Holy Spirit opens up your understanding to know that this, this here word is true and accurate. And it is for us to live by for reproof, doctrine, and correction. So let's go on to another prophecy and prophecy fulfilled. So in Psalms, we know that David wrote most of the Psalms and David wrote this particular Psalm, Psalm 22. And we're going to go 22 and we're going to read verse 14 through 18. And it reads, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shed. My tongue clings to my jaw. You have brought me to the dust of death. The dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of wicked has enclosed, en enclosed me. 
They pierce my hands and my feet. I count all my I count all my bones. They look and they stare at me. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing, they cast lots. This is the prophecy of Christ being crucified, them mocking him, them piercing him in his hands and his feet, them dividing, ripping his clothes in two and casting lots for his clothes. All of this is in this prophecy that King David wrote. Okay, now let's go to Matthew 27, 35. And let's see, as years later, Matthew writes the account. And we're gonna go to Matthew 27, and 35. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, it might, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing, they cast lots. Okay. So, Do you guys understand what is happening here? Prophecies are being fulfilled. Prophecies were being fulfilled. Things were prophesied. They came to they came to pass. It was written about in this book called the Bible. And it was recorded. It was inspired by by God, yet written by man. There were a few times in the Bible where we saw that God actually wrote it with himself, but everything else was recorded by mankind. Okay, so let's also, let's continue because there's a lot of prophecies to get through here. Um, let's go to the prophecy of his death between criminals and the place of his burial being buried in a rich man's tomb. And the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 53, and let's see, Isaiah 53, and we wanna read verse nine. Okay, and it says, they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. They made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at death, because he had no done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He was he has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall he shall see his seed and shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He shall see the labor of his soul be satisfied by his knowledge. My, my righteousness, my righteous servant shall justify many. He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the strong because he has poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with transgressors and he bore the sins of many and made intercessions for our transgress, for the transgressors, hallelujah. Okay, so here is the prophecy of Jesus dying between criminals and being buried with the rich. He, he um, it, it says that he, made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Okay, so now let's turn to um, Matthew 27, 57 through 60. And it reads, Now, when evening had come, there was a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph. This is a different Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. 
This man went to Pilate and he asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. And then when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in clean linen and he laid it in his new tomb, which he had hung, heaned out of rock and rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. Okay, so Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate and, and basically he petitioned for Christ's body. Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man. He already had his grave, his plot already picked out for him, for himself. But yet he took the body of Christ and put it in his own tomb, which was prophecy was fulfilled when Isaiah prophesied that he would be that he would die between criminals and that he would be buried in a rich man's tomb. Now let's go on to I, uh, Zechariah, the prophecy where he was sold out and betrayed for money. And I want you guys in your own time to go and read the entire chapter of Isaiah 53. That is the entire prophecy of everything um, that happened to Jesus during his crucifixion, his death and his resurrection. It, um, Isaiah had gotten that prophecy. So on your own time, go on and read the whole chapter. But for now, we're going to move on to Zechariah um, chapter 11. And Zechariah prophesied about um, Jesus being sold out for money. So let's go to Zechariah 11, 12 through 13. And it reads, Then I said to them, if it is agreeable to you, give me wages that if, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter. And the princely price yet set it on me. So I took 30 pieces of silver and threw it through them into the house of the Lord for the potter. Okay, so now... Um, what happened is, okay, so the prophet Jeremiah had al also prophesied about um, the Lord being betrayed for money and what was going to happen to that money. And he used it in um, the vision that he got was like a parable of uh, one buying a field, um, a potter's field for 30 pieces of silver um, and it, the money being thrown. So Zechariah got that same um, prophecy. He got that same vision. Okay. So now let's go and read Matthew 26, 14 through 16. And it reads, And when one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him the 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Okay, so now let's go to, hop over to the next chapter to Matthew 27, and we're going to read one through nine. Now in the morning came and all the chief priests and the elders of, of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then a Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had had been condemned was remorseful and he brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elders saying, I have sinned and betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hung himself. But the chief priests, they took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful for us to put this into the treasury because they are the price of blood. And they consulted together and they brought with them, they, and they brought with them uh, the potter's 
field to bury in strangers. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then it was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying that they took the 30 pieces of silver and valued him who was priced, whom they of the children of Israel priced and gave them for a potter's field as the Lord directed me. People, we cannot make this stuff up. There is no man that can sit and write prophecies and write predictions in its accuracy 100%. And it's just out of the imagination or the thought of a man. The word of God is, the word of God, the Bible is inspired by God. Okay. The prophet Daniel interpreted the dream by King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, okay? He dreamed of this huge statue with a head of gold, breast of silver, belly of brass, legs of iron, and feet mixed part iron and part clay, divided by 10. Then he saw stone come and break it up, the feet into pieces. And he saw this statue break into pieces of gold, then the silver, then brass, then clay is how it broke down. God gave Daniel the meaning of this dream, which was the prophecy of all the great empires of the world, even to today. Daniel interpreted the king's dream exactly how history of the empires that were in power, exactly how they unfolded. Each metal in that dream that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar uh, dreamed about, it represented a kingdom, an empire. Each empire was conquered, conquered the next, ex except for Rome, which we can go into detail and we'll study this. We'll study this at another lesson in detail. Nevertheless, this is proof that the contents of the Bible is true. The each, each Metal, the gold representing Babylon. Babylon was the first great empire. And then there was the Medio Persian Empire that was the silver. It was the Mede Persians that conquered Babylon. And then there was the, the, um, the belly of brass that represented the the Greek and the uh, Macedonian Empire, Leo, Leo part, um, that was the leper. They conquered the Medo Persian Empire. Check your history, people. Check your history. Look up all the great kingdoms and great empires. Check all the kingdoms, their fall, their conquered, who conquered who. And it is exactly, exactly like Daniel prophesied to King Nebuchadnezzar all oh, those years ago that's written in this Bible, okay? I can go on and on and on with biblical truths, noted historical facts, and proof of fulfilled prophecies validating the Bible as being correct. One of the biggest discoveries of proof of validity of the Bible was the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now I'm gonna just give this as the last example, because that was one of the biggest proofs. The authentic Dead Sea Scrolls traced back to 1947. There have been many copies and many fakes out there, just like we also know that God is the creator and Satan is the imitator. So Satan always copies and he always perverts and he always takes what looks right and perverts it, copies it and perverts it. So it doesn't surprise me that there were copies of the Dead Sea Scroll, but they actually found the authentic Dead Sea Scrolls in a Bedouin's um, herder found the clay, these clay jars in the Palestine um, quorum caves and it had a, it had thousands of parchment scrolls more than 1800 years old including some of the oldest surviving copies of the Hebrew Bible this that proves that this stuff is true this is not stuff people are just making up this is not just bad dreams people are having or good dreams if you will 
and man just decides, oh, I'm going to write this book of prophecy and hey, all of my prophecies are going to come true. Mankind can't, can't give themselves that much credit, people. The word of God, hallelujah, was inspired by God. Wow. Did, to me, this stuff is so good. This is something every believer should have and understand the knowledge, uh, have knowledge about. The word of God also tells us that my people perish for a lack of knowledge. The prophet Hosea said that, and this is the reason why if you run across people who want to challenge your faith or challenge what you believe, why you have to have an apologetic. You have to have verbal defense. Know what you believe. Stand for what you believe. But you got to know it first. You got to read. You got to study. Further, if we seek him, we will find him. It is our responsibility and our service to seek after. It is our reasonable service to seek after the truth. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7, he said, knock and the door shall be open. Seek and you shall find. Ask people and it shall be given. That's all you got to do when you want to really know the truth. But you got to be earnest about wanting to know the truth, not wanting to know it for the sake of argument. But hey, God can deal with that too. God's not afraid of our questions. He's not afraid of skepticism either. He is all-knowing, all-powerful. He is unchanging. God changes not. It is up to us to know who we are in the Lord, to know who we are, whose we are, and who we are. And the only way we can know that is by studying the word to show ourselves approved. We must seek after truth and righteousness, which can only be given by the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. Because the spirit uh, it bears witness and gives it bears witness to righteousness. It bears witness to Christ. And although many skeptics, crit, skeptics and critic, um, skept, I'm sorry, although there are many skeptical critics, they have some valid questions. Some of the questions that people ask about, you know, what you believe, these are valid questions. I myself had these questions, and I'm sure many of you others have had these same questions. That does not cancel out the truth of the gospel just because you have those questions. But what it should do for mature, mature believers is provoke an opportunity to witness and give an apologetic for your faith. So there are many more examples that the Bible is inspired by God. Yes, the words were technically written by man. Everything done under the sun is done by man. But the inspiration of what to write, when it was to be written, and by whom the author would be is divine work of the Most High God Elohim himself. Hallelujah. And the answer to the questions of the translation versus the transliteration errors from one language to the next, we all must agree that translation could never be word for word. It could never be word from word from one language to the next because some languages don't even share the same alphabets. Some languages don't even have the same characters. So we know that the translation can never be word for word. Let's agree on that and understand that. Don't let people try to trip you up with, oh, it was translated and it, you know, it can never be right. It's been translated in so many different languages. It's been transliterated. All of that. Listen, people, we all agree that it was translated. But if God is so powerful, which he is, he's all knowing, which he is. He's the great I am, which he is. He's the creator of everything, including all the different languages. Remember, he confused the languages. God got this, okay? If he is all powerful, which we know he is, certainly the content of his message 
He can preserve it. He don't need us. We need him. Okay? God can preserve his word. He can preserve the message and the meaning. It doesn't matter that everything is not word for word. The content of what he wants us to know is right here. Okay? Certainly the content of his message can be preserved throughout time. Regardless to the word translation, the message has never been lost. Is the Lord not the Lord? Is God not God? Does he not have power to keep and preserve his word? God forbid. He who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleep. He preserves our souls. Certainly he can preserve his word. Men write blogs. Men write newspapers and biographies and autobiographies, medical journals. They write science books and many, many more books. And we believe what is written in them. So why is the Bible so controversial and doubted so often? The things that men actually do write, people believe. But when God writes something, huh, I don't know about that. I, 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 I doubt it. Come on, people. Come on, people. You only doubt it because you don't want to believe it. Okay? Other than one chooses, people choose to doubt it. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, and it cuts and convicts us of our sinful ways. Hebrews 4.12. Some men choose to be resistant to it. They have made their free will choice, because remember, we started by saying God made us to have free will. So people choose their free, they take their free will, and they choose to harden their hearts to the word of God. Because it is easier to disbelieve or to believe in a lie than to surrender our own fallible ways to the Lord and be saved. This is why Jesus said, many are called, but only few are chosen. I'm going to let you guys think about that for a minute. Take a moment and meditate on that. Because to me, that is very profound and it's kind of scary verse. Many are called, but only few are chosen. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to man, but to the end is destruction. Jesus said, the way to righteousness is straight. It's straight and it's narrow. It's straight and narrow. You see this? straight and narrow broad is the way to destruction matthew 7 14. although this is just scratching the surface of this topic i hope that this will help you to have a basic understanding of what and why you believe in the holy bible the gospel of jesus christ rather than the plethora of written literature in this world i hope this builds a foundation for your apologetics have a blessed week and i am praying for you all Thank you so much. I love you all in Jesus' name. So now I'm going to close this out. I hope you guys were edified by this, and I hope this really helped you. Heavenly Father, I thank you, dear Lord, for this time, for this hour, Lord, for you are great and greatly to be praised. Lord, I pray that we will take this in and that these words will just resonate in our spirits, Lord, Father God, that we will grow stronger in you and that we will always be ready, always be ready to give verbal defense for, for the hope that we have and what we believe. Help us to not have blind faith, but to know why we believe in you, know why we trust you, and to stand firm on our belief and help us, Lord, Father God, to deliver our message of love of you 
eternal life. May we deliver it in love and meekness. Lord, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this hour. I thank you for your grace and mercy. Now bless your children, Lord Father God. Bless us, strengthen us, and prepare us for your coming. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, everybody. So that is a wrap. Thank you for coming in on our session today at NCIC Fellowship Group. And remember, be ready for... Um, your verbal defense, be ready to give a cause for your hope. Ciao for now.